Welcome back to Native Honor Hours. My name is Ed Zendejas, and my co-host is... Cindy Kravka. All right, we have a special guest today, but uh, before we get to our guest, it's Sherry Becerra Matson. But before that, Cindy wants to uh, make a presentation or announcement. Just, I just want to say it is National Day of Remembrance for U.S. boarding schools. We wear orange in remembrance because of a young native girl who, whose orange dress was taken away from her. So far, they found over 6,500 kids buried from the residential schools. And it really affects a lot of us. Most of Ed, our parents, our generation, were the boarding school generation. My mom was in boarding school. My grandma was in boarding school. My great aunt was 12 years old and died at Carlisle. So the boarding schools really affect us all in the long term historical trauma, how we were raised, how our parents parented. So today we just like to uh, call a little attention to the problem. Well, I, actually I was speaking a little bit, actually a lot about this in my classes today. So we, we covered that and uh, I, I think it's a story, not a story, it's a history that is uh, swept underneath the rug. And I think, I think now today there were more attention is being called to that era and also the long uh, lasting effects from that. But we're also well, here. Know, the attention was taken away because our parents didn't talk about it. I don't know one story from my mom at the boarding school. So they just didn't talk about things like that. And if they would have, maybe we would have understood ourselves better. It would have helped me understand who my mom was. Well, I, I think I've come to an understanding of uh, you know, what my mom went through and a better appreciation for that. So, but we're also here today to, to celebrate one of our own who uh, has done some amazing things and, and uh, doesn't, doesn't get enough attention spotlight because we really need to hear uh, the, the good things that are happening in our community and especially the things that uh, Sherry has accomplished uh, throughout her her lifetime and Olympics, it doesn't you know Billy Mills won medal and we love Billy. And, I love Billy too. <laughs> yeah, you know we really he's been here a couple times and he's a great man. And uh, but your story is is incredible. Yes. And uh, you're you're right here amongst uh, our people in our community and we're. We're excited to have you. So you want to give us a little background in terms of uh, uh, what events you do, what, what got you into in, into competitive racing? Um, sure. So I'm a, I'm a sprinter. I do the 100 meters and the 400 meters. I started racing back in 1994. And it really just kind of happened just, just – um, her name was Candy Remeyer. She worked at the school for the visually impaired. And she just knocked on our door one day and asked if we had ever heard of wheelchair racing. I was in the same grade as her son. And so she would see me like push around town just in my everyday chair. And she just asked if it would be something we'd be interested in. So my mom and I called the number at the bottom of the article. And two weeks later, I was in Wichita, Kansas. That was the first time I had ever seen a racing wheelchair. And I get in, um, his name was Jim Martinson. So I raced in his racing chair. And so he's a, he's a man and I was just this little 17 year old girl. And we had to roll up t-shirts and towels to make sure I could fit in his chair. And I get in his chair and I end up beating pretty much every athlete that was there. And I just knew instantly, like, this was just meant for me. I just, I fell in love with it right away. Was well, everybody I, saying, where did she come from? Where did she come from? Yes, exactly there. So everybody was just so surprised. But, I mean, that's kind of with any sport. You know, anybody can just pop up and it kind of shocks you, right? So I think I was that young little girl back then that kind of jumped on the scene and had success pretty quickly. Who, who trained you? Or did you just sort of train yourself? So I come from, so Nebraska City is where I was, where I lived at the time. And my community helped purchase my very first racing chair. And one day 
a guy by the name of Gary Mills just knocked, I'm sorry, Gary Ailes just knocked on our front door and asked if I needed any help. He was an avid marathon runner. And we were like, yeah, sure. And it's just some local guy from my community that was my first coach. And he initially showed up just in his running shoes. And I got in my racing chair and we kind of did a workout. And he was like, um, yeah, next time I'm bringing my bike. And so from then on out, he used his bike. But yeah, it was all just trial and error. He went to some coaching clinics at the University of Illinois just to kind of get some knowledge of wheelchair racing. And we worked together eh, probably for a year and a half until I got a different coach out of Eugene, Oregon, and he specialized in wheelchair racing. So, and his name was Kevin Hansen. He was my second coach. All right. Tell us how it felt when you, uh, apparently you had to go through all of the qualifying events, but how it felt, because none of us will ever experience qualifying for an Olympic event. So how was it when you went there and your experience and when you qualified for the you Olympics? The first time? So my first Olympic experience was in 1996. And in 96, there was an 800 meter wheelchair event at the Olympics. And the Paralympics are two weeks after the Olympics. And so we had the Olympic games first and we went right after the 100 meter men. So it was a packed stadium. So there was like 80,000 plus people in the stands. Wow. And my coach and I, we had talked about like it was an 800 meter half a mile not my strongest event and he's like okay at 300 you need to break away from the pack because I was a sprinter and I at the 300 and it was wet and rainy and it was just probably not the best circumstances for racing but as I broke away from the pack you could just hear like the whole crowd like erupting because you know I have that USA flag on the front of my jer on the front of my jersey. It was just, it was probably the best feeling and probably to me, my favorite memory ever. I mean, I, I came away with a bronze medal. So yeah, that was that's probably my favorite and most memorable event. How old were you at that event then? I was let's see, I, was, I think I was 19. Wow very young for that kind of pressure. Yeah. And that was you know, only two years after you got your first. I have to say, um, I come from such a large family and it took a lot of like dedication from everybody to like support me. There was a family of six kids. And so like wow. my parents, especially my mom, like she would leave and she would travel with me because I was so young at the time. And, you know, it was a lot of time away from home. So it definitely took a lot of family support to you know get me to at that competitive level so very thankful that you know my family was able to support me well my, my I have eight kids and my older kids used to run a lot my sons and they did the the summer AAU and the junior olympics and most of our summer vacations were spent uh traveling to wherever the meets were for my sons my sons so so I have a a little bit of an understanding of, of sort of what went into your family support. And uh, that was, that was a, a thing that struck me was that you do come from a large family and it took a lot of uh, your family support. What is your, what do your brothers and sisters think? Well, <clears throat> at the time, um, they were supportive. Like um, they can't, they went to Atlanta and they got to watch me compete. So everybody drove, got in the Suburban and drove down to Atlanta. So they got to see me race in Atlanta. And my younger, the youngest brother at the time, he was like three, four years old. And he traveled with my mom and I like everywhere because he was so young. And so he got to watch a lot of my competitions and he traveled everywhere with us. So I remember like just him always being around and just, you know, he was a huge part of it, too. He was just so cute. One of my first races that I've ever won, because I also did road racing at the time. And one of my first races I ever won, it was in Boulder, Colorado. I bought him a swing set. 
you know, back then, those big wooden ones that were yep. like all the rage. Yeah, I bought him a swing set just because he, you know, was such a huge part of what I did. And he's wow. actually the reason why I started racing again. And you took a hiatus. How long was it? I did 13 years. So after um, 2000, which was in Sydney, uh, I wanted to get married and I wanted to have babies. Uh, it was, you know, I just wanted to start a different chapter of my life. And I was blessed with two beautiful girls. So oh, in 2000 and seven my youngest had just turned a, a year old and mario that's my youngest brother's name he asked me if i was going to start wheelchair racing again and honestly i thought he was crazy i was like i just had a baby <laughs> like racing isn't anywhere in my mind and he was just told me that he believed i could still do it and he wanted the girls to kind of share those same experiences he had growing up and i was like okay, Mario, <laughs> like, I just kind of honestly laughed him off because it just wasn't something at the time that I was interested in, really. And then December of that year, December 23rd, um, him and my dad were, um, they died in a car accident just oh. a half a mile from my house. A train clipped the back of their car and they, they both um passed away instantly so, I'm so sorry you know his and, and words that, kind of sat with me after that i mean and it i read where you when life. you came back and you wanted that's to why you know, his, his words you know it meant a lot well and, and i read where you where you came back to honor the memory of your brother that's him and uh yeah. you, you did quite well almost immediately Right or I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like he's always just with me. He's never really left me. How hard is it to train with two small children? Well, now they're big. Um, my oldest is in college, and my youngest is a sophomore in high school. Um, when they were younger, because I've been doing this now since two thousand and thirteen. It was fun. Like they would go to the track with me and sometimes I'd like chase them down when they were little. So they were a part of it when they were smaller. And I think the worst part was just like having to leave them all the time. You know, the technology is so great, like with FaceTime and stuff like that. So, I mean, I definitely did my best to, you know, keep in contact with them. And, you know, you always get the phone calls of mom, when are you going to come home? You know, every parent hates that, but you know, I was doing what I loved and I wanted them to experience it well you uh you, you just completed what the, the last olympics is uh just a couple months ago tokyo yes How and they was couldn't that? Go. like nobody could go to tokyo it was so sad that was always the goal well how was that experience for you did, did you go in i know you said that you're done right yes you know going into tokyo like my coaches are from Texas, and we had a lot of discussions about Tokyo, especially with the whole year of COVID. So, like, for me, I just got a year older, right? And I'm still trying to, you know, figure out, like, training and all these things. And then all these younger girls got stronger and faster. And so, quite honestly, I was nervous about even making the team. I was just like, I hadn't seen anybody race in a year. And so you don't know where anybody's at. You know, normally in the past, you know what everybody's times are. You've met up with them. Just, I had no idea. So when I made the, the team, it was like a huge relief. And then my coach, her name's Wendy. She was like, all right, now we have to worry about meddling. She goes, that's going to be the hard part. And so I was definitely nervous going into these games than any other games I've ever been a part of. You sort of had something to prove to the young ones, huh? I think so. I mean, it was it was tough. Like um, Hannah Diedrich, she just, um, she'll, she, I think she just started college, yeah. And I've raced with her for these past four years, and she kept getting faster and faster. So I knew she was coming. And so this year she beat me like maybe three times in the 100, and it was always just by 
you know, hundreds of a second. So we were always battling all year long. And so when I got bronze in the hundred, I was like, I guess I, I did it when it counted, but it was tough. Like, I don't know if I could do it again. You know, what a great role model for women to say that, you know, no, you're not too old. You could still do this and do it well. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you were able to watch the race, but I definitely waited until that last, that last three one hundredths of a second to pass her. But it was, it was great. I mean, I didn't medal in 2016 in the one. I think I finished fifth. And so to come out this time on, you know, in third place with two younger girls that beat me. So I was, I'm good. I'm happy with my performance. So have have you thought about maybe I'm not done? Maybe there's maybe one more Olympics in me? No, because I don't want to get beat. Um, I just, I don't want to, in like my mind, you know, I put three to four hours in a day training and I couldn't imagine going and not, not meddling. And that's, I mean, I know that's a risk every time you, you know, you go to a games. But I went into Tokyo knowing that this would be my last Paralympics. I'm just turned 45. And I mean, I know age is just a number, but at, you know, at some point in time, that number does start to catch up. And, you like know. Like Tom I'm, Brady, you never get old. He might not never get old, but um, I, <laughs> I certainly am. <laughs> you have any plans for uh, maybe coaching or maintaining some presence in the sport? So after talking with my coaches, so I still have like, um, so like um, I'm on the U.S. national team. And so I'll be on the team until June. And so I'll probably finish out my national team status. And so like next season, I'll do a couple meets. And we've actually talked about doing like road racing just to stay like in shape and you know, still be a part of my, you know, the wheelchair racing community. Um, another thing is I go to Texas quite a bit. They have a really good um, youth sports program. And so I go down there and I help my coaches quite a bit. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what the future holds. Like, I just want to stay relevant and, you know, I want to give back in any way I can. Well, you're a role model for a, a lot of young Native girls who don't hear, get the message that you can do this you're giving them the message that, yeah, you can. You know, and I, I, I feel like I definitely do. And I feel that same way towards my own girls because, you know, they, they've seen it firsthand, you know, what hard work and dedication, you know, can do for you. Um, I definitely, you know, it hasn't always been like the best. I've definitely had bad meets and I've definitely had injuries that I've had to overcome. And so they've seen all those trials and, you know, how I overcame all of them. So, yeah, you kept getting if back. I can up. share my message. That's a great thing for our daughters. You kept getting ba- back up no matter what. That's amazing. Thank you. I, I, I know there was a documentary done on your life, right? Yeah. It, they, um, Nebraska Educational Television followed me around through my um, 96 games. So it's called. Um, the Sherry Becerra story, God made her for the sport. Man, what a cool title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. That was that was a good experience just for me and my whole family. But that was only chapter one. Have you thought about uh, you know, maybe writing a book <laughs> or you're laughing? I'm serious. Because everybody says that. Like I hear it all the time. <laughs> I don't know yet. We'll see what happens. Because your story needs to be kind told. Of discipline. It does. It does. definitely takes a different type of discipline. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I always just laugh because, you know, I come from such a, a, a big family and, you know, my mom was so instrumental in everything. And, you know, she just, she passed away in 2019. And, you know, we always talked about like writing a book and she was all like, what are you gonna put in your books? So I don't know. <laughs> that would have been my mom. What are you gonna say about me? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, as far as uh, y- your children, I know they're they're fairly, I take it active in uh, sports. They get that from 
from mom, huh? Yeah, uh, my oldest, she's playing um, softball in Beatrice. She's in Southeast Community College, and we just watched her play a couple games last night in Lincoln, and, you know, she's really enjoying it, and yeah, and my youngest, she runs cross country, and they're both, they're both great athletes. I mean, they're three sport athletes. They get good grades. Um, yeah, they work really hard. I used to teach at Southeast Community College down at Beatrice campus. It's, it's a fairly nice little uh, community down there. You know, and she needed something small. We definitely toured some bigger schools. And she just, she wasn't having it. And then we went to Beatrice, she was like, yeah, this is it. Like, I just think she needed the smaller classrooms, the smaller communities. And she's, she says she really likes it and she likes her teammates and she's enjoying classes. So, you know, she was nervous this whole summer. If she was the, she's like, I don't want to go. I'm like, no, you're going, <laughs> you're going to go. You'll like it. I promise. You, you ever thought about going on uh, sort of a lecture circuit around, uh, you know, schools and high schools or universities, you ever thought about that? You know, I've done a lot around my area, um, a lot of the communities around here. Uh, you know, I've actually been kind of talking to uh, my uncle about this, you know, maybe starting something up like that and going around the U.S. and maybe speaking, you know, that's something that could also be in my future. I think I have a lot of prospects out there. Well, like I said before, the reason why I wanted to invite you on is because, uh, you know, I followed, I followed your, your career because my, like I said, my kids were into track and I have a son about your age. And, and, uh, so we, we sort of followed what you were doing and, and, uh, and I know that, uh, you're just, you're just a great, uh, role model and example. And I, and I, and I, felt like we needed to have you on so that uh, uh, your story could be told. Because really what struck me was when you did the interview with uh, Channel I think 7 when you came back, right? I didn't you, even see it. I didn't even see it. <laughs> well, I, I, what struck me was, I, I it, did they surprise you by that? Yes. Because you had this look of surprise and shock that they would, you know, the TV cameras would follow. And I thought, yeah, they should be there. And, you know, you need to be in everybody's, you know, Facebook feeds, uh, you know, that you need to be told, because seriously, there, I can't think of, you know, too many that could say they've been to, what, five Olympics, four or five medal, 10 medals? Yep, four Olympics. There's not too many medals that could say that. So I was, I was really happy and pleased that, uh, you know, they put you on TV, and I thought we got to have you and let our native oh, community you. know that uh, we, we've got somebody out there that's doing incredible things. So, well, and if you don't want to write a big book, how about a children's book? What a great role model for little girls! Yeah, that'd be good too. Like I said, I think I, I think there's a lot of things I can do. So we'll see what I come up with in the end, and I'm sure it'll be something. Well, well we'll when you do. It. And having you back. Thank I was going to say, when you do, let us know. We'll be happy to, to have you back and and uh, share some more of what you're up to. But once again, we're, we're, medals, oh sorry. my goodness, look at that. Wow. These are the ones from Tokyo. My wow. silver for the 400 and my bronze for the 100. See, that's <laughs> as close as Cindy and I ever get to anything like a medal. <laughs> Yeah, even seeing one. Wow, that's amazing. Now, if you put a sandwich up in front of us, we're there. You're there, okay. <laughs> you could make it into a beaded medallion. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. And, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'd like to stand, if you do something, you announce you want to come back or you want to, you know, start racing or whatever you want to do, let us know and we'll be happy to, to inform the community. And uh, like I said, we, we'd, we'd love to hear more from you regarding if you want to write a book or they're going to do another movie on you. Let us know. <laughs> because I'll let you know, whenever you come on our show, people just blow up. I mean, they become big stars once they make an appearance on our show. Oh, this is the beginning. 
<laughs> no, we have about 10 de dedicated followers. <laughs> I need all the followers I can get. And he says <laughs> that. We are also on Spotify. We are on Facebook. We are on public television and Insta. Kenny just put us on Insta, Ed. I don't even know what that means. You know, you know who I'm going to nominate? Sherry, you watch Res Dogs? I, yep, I already watched it. <laughs> I'm going to throw out here, I know you're going to move me. Brother Gary. Brother, Brother Gary, Gary for, okay. for, for, for the finale. Takes a lot, a lot of, takes a lot to do that, Brother Gary. And for that, I'm, I'm nominating you for any of the week. Uh, here's a knucklehead of the week, Cindy. And, and this comes from uh, Cassie. You know, she posted, somebody wrote an editorial on some newspaper saying, and this is appropriate for today, said, you just need to get over all that uh, boarding residential school stuff. It happened, move past it. So to whoever, whoever wrote that article and whoever thinks that way, you're, you're bigger than a knucklehead, but you're our knucklehead of the week if you have that type of attitude about what happened in the Indian boarding schools and to the kids and what's happening today. So with that, Kenny, once again, thank you, Sherry, for coming thank on. Thank you. It was uh, great you having me. you. And uh, very, very, very proud of you. Can't say enough about all the things that you've done for us <laughs> and it's just incredible to me. And just the thought of uh, even seeing an Olympic medal, I'm just like, that's incredible. Anyway, Kenny, want to take us out? Thank you, everybody. See you next week. We'll see you next week. Thank you.